am not who, look, look at your neighbor and say, I'm not who I once was. Yeah, my whole life has been changed. Yeah, I met the forgiver. And now this sinner. You know you're a sinner, right? That's why you need a savior. I'm a sinner, you a sinner, all of us are sinners. The only one ever lived on the earth that was not a sinner is Jesus Christ. The Bible says he lived among us. He was tempted just like we are. So Jesus knows how you feel. He doesn't just know that you were tempted. He knows how it feels to be you. So when you look at yourself and say, no one has ever felt like this, think Jesus has. And he knows, how, he knows what it is like to be you and to feel what you feel. And yet the Bible says he was without sin. So he's the only one. None of us are going to make it because we're perfect, all right? That's why we need a Savior. And so you meet the Redeemer. You meet the Forgiver. You meet the Redeemer, the Savior, and then life is never the same. And that's the testimony of our life. That's what Christ does. When somebody says, are you saved? <laughs> you know? And I know in this old crazy world, the word saved really doesn't mean much anymore like it used to when I was a child. When you'd, somebody would say, are you saved? And we knew immediately what they were asking us. Do you know the Lord? Has your life been changed? Have you come to Christ? It's, well, saved from what? Saved from going to hell when I die. You know? That's what it means. And, 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 of course, that word has lost its authority because everybody wants to feel like everybody's okay. You're okay. I'm okay. We're all okay. Aren't we? <laughs> you know, aren't we? No, you're not okay. You need a Savior. And no matter how much the world preaches that, shh, man, everybody's going to be all right and all that kind of stuff, that's not what the Bible says. And I don't know about you, but the Bible is the only book in the world that it has the authority of someone who has been dead and come back to life again. Yeah. I know, I mean, let me just draw you a little word out of this. Uh, uh, and this is where I get in trouble with time. But, but anyway, uh, there was a, a person who died in the New Testament. And, and he went and he was called the rich man. He, not, he wasn't named, he was just called the rich man. And he, got, he dies and he goes to hell, the Bible says. And he's being tormented. And Another beggar dies whose name is Lazarus who, who is, has come to Christ and so forth. And so, thank you, brother. And so he says, uh, the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes and saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom in paradise. Everybody say, heaven before Jesus went back to glory. Yeah, he was in paradise in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man said, uh, I, I want to be where Lazarus is because he's in comfort and I'm tormented in these flames. And, and Jesus said, no, you can't because there's a great gulf fixed between you and him so that no one from your zone can go to his zone and no one from his zone can come to your zone. And so the rich man then said, well, send Lazarus back so he can tell my brothers not to come to this, this horrible place. And Jesus said, they have Moses and the prophets. Everybody say, the word of God. Jesus said, they have the word of God. Let them hear that. Because they wouldn't believe someone even if he did rise and go back. That's what Jesus said. I mean, I didn't add that editorial comment. That's exactly what the verses say. Jesus said, they wouldn't believe it if somebody did rise from the grave and go back and tell them about this horrible place. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe anybody that says, I've been dead and let me tell you, it's a horrible place. Don't come here and blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, someone has died and come back. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he said, let me tell you what it takes to go to heaven when you die. And that is to surrender yourselves to the complete authority of Jesus Christ living on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit of God gets deposited into your life. You're never the same anymore. You have relationship with God. You are born into the family of God. The Bible says that you are adopted into the family of God. And if you know anything about adoption, adopted children can never be disinherited. You're a natural child of somebody. If they don't like you in the will, they can say, I'm not giving them a dime. But if you're an adopted child, they can't do that to you. Why? Because they have, they, the law will not allow them 
to disavow an adopted child. God says we're adopted into the family of God. Listen, Jesus is my brother. God is my father. I have a relationship that can never be changed. Now, my fellowship, on the other hand, might be a little altered. And you guys know this in your own family. Man, God is not, God is not awkward. God does not use uh, uh, ideas and concepts that are foreign to us. The same thing is true in the family of God that's true in your family. If you have a child, I don't care if the child becomes an axe murderer, he's still your child. If he, if he spends his time in San Quentin or Sing Sing or what used to be Alcatraz or whatever, it doesn't matter. He's still your child. Now, you may not have him at home for Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving meal because he doesn't obey. He doesn't act right. You don't want him around. So your fellowship is separated, but your relationship is solid. We have relationship with God because of Jesus Christ who saves our soul, and we agree with that and say, yes, Jesus, come into my life and change me forever. I've met the forgiver, and now, uh, now this sinner will never be the same. Yeah, yeah. But my fellowship may be stressed and strained, and I may be far from God, and the Holy Spirit keeps convicting me and convicting me, come on back, you know, you're not right. That's not what people say. They, you know, and God keeps drawing you and wooing you and drawing you and wooing you and drawing you and wooing you until one day you go so far that he says, oh, come on home, man. If I can't correct you down there, I'll just have to get you up here and correct you. Just like you do at the grocery store when your child won't behave. When your child won't behave at the grocery store, you can't, you, you pop their little legs or something, you know, and say, get, get. well, they keep on acting horsey about things. What do you do? You go just put your groceries back on the shelf. No, you push your cart over there for everybody else to put your groceries back up. And then you, and then you go out the door and you say, when I get you home, I'm going to take care of you. Same way with God. You that one acting wild in a shopping cart? He just says, all right, come on home. And when I get you home, I'm going to take care of you. We'll straighten you out. I mean, God's not awkward in his analogies. Yeah, yeah. He's, he, he, he says, you know, I don't think you're more rational than I am. You know, <laughs> I mean, he created us, guys. But anyway, I hope that fits into anything else I have to say today. <laughs> I believe it will because you'll see the church at Sardis is a unique situation going on. We, we're in our fifth letter, yeah. the five. We're, we're in the section called uh, Things That Are. You know, in Revelation there, the things which you have seen, which is chapter 1, it's Jesus and his glory and manifested. We went through that. Chapters 2 and 3 are things that are. And, and, and basically, the Lord is saying, let me tell you how things are. Let me tell you how things are going to be on this earth while the, while the Spirit of grace is functioning, while the Spirit of God is moving and convicting people and people can come to me, while there's still time, the door is still open. This is how people are going to be. This is how churches are going to be. And then he writes letters to seven churches to say, this is how it is. If you want to know while human beings are alive on this earth that can still be saved and come to God, chapters 2 and 3 is written to you to say, this is how church life is. This is how the world is. This is how spirit life is. And then he gives us seven individual churches that have seven different personalities and several different, seven different influences to say this represents how church life is on the earth before the end. Because in chapter four, we're going to start the new section, which what shall be hereafter. And then Jesus will take us into the hereafter. We will go to heaven. We true believers in Christ. I didn't say everybody who's sitting in this church. Because the church, building, chairs, functions, guitars, music, the church is not going to heaven. You are. You are the church. This is just the place where we meet. So some of you, after the beginning of chapter 4, will come to church the next Sunday and there won't be a lot of people here. But you'll be on the door and you'll be going rattling it, going, why isn't the church open? And then, and, then, and then the Antichrist will explain something to you and you'll go, well, that makes sense to me. 
I mean, blooming Russians might do it. I mean, they're doing everything else nowadays. I mean, the Russians got them, you know. Our UFOs finally came back to the world. And you say, that's so silly. Well, it won't be then because you'll be deluded. God says in Thessalonians, and I will send them strong delusion, not the devil trick them. He said, I'm going to send delusion to them so that they'll believe the lie. What lie? The lie that the Antichrist tells you. And you'll just go merrily down the way, just like a lamb to slaughter. Oh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I get that makes sense to me. That's wonderful. You know, I, I never thought about it that way. Oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, every great person, every friendly person, every warm person, every person I thought belonged to Christ is gone. But, hey, man, you know how tricky those Russians can be. And you'll merrily go down the trail. I'm just telling you that chapters 2 and 3 are about how things are. And you better pay attention to how things are because this is, this is where we live in right now. We are living in this. And when you recognize and identify yourself, this is talking to you. Yeah. And it's telling you, you, hey, wake up. Pay attention to this. This is eternity. This is vital. This is what's going to happen to you and your children and your grandchildren and everybody else that lives on this earth. Because there's coming a day when Jesus is going to come back. That's chapter 4, verse 1. Read it sometime. Chapter 4, verse 1, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice that said, Come up here, and I'll show you great and mighty things which shall be hereafter. He calls the church. John is representative of the whole church, the true church of Jesus Christ. Because after chapter 4, you never see the church again on this earth, the true church. You never even hear the name. 39 times in chapters 1, 2, and 3, the word church, 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 mentioned. After chapter 4, boom, never mentioned again. Why? It's not here. There's no church to talk to because the real church has gone home. Oh, now there will be a bunch of denominations and there will be a bunch of churches, doors open. Some of them won't even realize anything's happened because they hadn't been with the Holy Spirit from the beginning. They're filled with people that are lost and don't know the Lord and they're practicing their ceremonies and their rituals and their, and their flow of service and their robes and their gowns and their, and their choirs and their tapestry and majesty and blah, 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 and just lost, never even recognized. They'll be business as usual for that bunch. But the true church, the real church, the believers will be gone yeah. to meet the Lord. So it's vital, the relationship in chapters 2 and 3 between the real church and the unreal church is vital for you to see. And the Lord wants to say, hey, tell them like it is because they need to know that there's some real things of God and there's some fake things of God. Yeah. And don't be deluded by the fake things of God because it will lead you to hell and destruction and death. But show them the truth. Tell them like it is, John. And so Jesus himself starts talking to us in these chapters to say, I'm going to just be honest and lay it right bare before you. So we've been through five churches. The church at Ephesus that had sound doctrine, but they lost their love. The church at Smyrna that was persecuted and, and, and harassed and, and, and made hard for by the government and by the Judaizers and those people that were fake religious people tried to make it hard on the church. And you know, then, then the church at Pergamos, the church that, that uh, started uh, mar that married the world and started trying to somehow incorporate the spirit of the world and the spirit of God, and they left their understanding and teaching. And then Thyatira was born, which was pure idolatry and so forth. And then now we come to the fifth church, which is the church at Sardis, and it's completely dead. This church is the dead church. And the Lord identifies it as that. Look at it, what he says to them. And to the angel, everybody say the pastor. The spiritual leader. The, that's what the angel is. The angel of the church. Believe it or not, I'm your angel. You got cheated is all I'm saying. Don't I look like an angel? <laughs> I'm the angel to this church. I'm, I'm the messenger. I'm God's voice. I'm the one through which the Holy Spirit is to speak. I'm the one that God has ordained. I didn't want to be it. 
it, it, I mean, it would be more comfortable for me if it was somebody else. That's right. That's, that's, you see, this head glows. This is the anointing you're seeing. I don't, some of these guys that are watching, they may say, he is so full of himself. Um, I hope they can see, you know, that kind of uh, sarcastic look on my face or that kind of uh, look on my face that says, I'm kidding, okay? I'll guarantee you somebody will believe that I really mean that. But, but the point is, um, I, that's what I am. I am responsible to tell you the truth. It's my responsibility to say, here's what God says to you. Not, not me. This is not my po- time to get up here and spout politics or sports or drama or movies or whatever. My responsibility is to take the Word of God and to rightly divide it so you can hear from the Holy Spirit. That's what my job is. And I know some of you say, well, I don't really need to hear that. And I'm just going to say to you, the more you think you don't need it, the more you probably do. And you need to ask the Lord, give me discernment, Lord, to hear with my spiritual heart. Because sometimes I'm talking about something and your mind is out in the twilight zone because you don't think you need to hear it. You think, oh, what difference does it make about some dead church 3,000 years ago? It makes a lot of difference if that's you. And the Lord's trying to say, hello, Mac Fly, open up. Are you listening? So I'm just saying, don't fade out and fuzz out on these seven churches because I'm telling you, Jesus is saying, I'm talking to you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? To every one of them at the end, he says, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He's saying to you, are you listening to what I'm saying? Is this you? Yeah. If this is you, you, got, you still have an opportunity to make a choice that will change the direction of your life. And you better take it while you still have a chance because in just a couple of more churches, we're gone. And then it's going to be too late. And, what, and, and, and the unbelieving church, the unsaved masses, what are they going to be left to? The greatest time of tribulation this world has ever seen. I'm going to tell you, when we get to chapter 4, 4 through 22, you are going to be blown out of the water, amazed at what God says is going to happen on this earth. Let me just say this to you one more time. The book of Revelation is not to inform you about Star Wars things that are going to come. The book of Revelation is not to confuse you with symbolisms and types and so forth so you can understand. These bizarre analogies and metaphors and pictures and views all have a purpose. And, they, and, and look, look at your neighbor and say, you can understand this. Look, this book was not written to confuse you. This book was, revi- was written to reveal to you, to open up to you what things are going to happen. You need to know this. Your lives, your children, your grandchildren, the future of your families and lives depend on you knowing these things. And Jesus said, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of the Holy Spirit. God's not trying to show us the Holy Spirit. He's not trying to show us the church. He's not trying to show us poetry or literature, blah, blah. And it says, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is book about? It is to reveal Jesus Christ to you. What is Jesus doing in these last days? Where is Jesus in these last days? What what does Jesus want us to know in these last days? The book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus to you in these last days. That's why the devil fights so hard against it. That's why he doesn't want you to hear it. That's why the book gets mentioned a lot, but nobody preaches on it. That's why you've probably heard a lot about the book in your Christian life, but you've never had anybody just go verse by verse and open it up to you, even though the book itself says you will be blessed if you hear this and if you understand this and if you do this. He says it at the beginning and at the end, the only book in the Bible that says you are blessed if you read this book and if you understand this book and if you will do what it says. So the devil says, let me make sure nobody ever does that. So I'll make the preachers afraid to talk about it. I'll make the people, you know, get all captivated in the spooky part about it. And then the first few weeks, it's not spooky. So I'm tired of that mess. 
Well, you're walking away from what God is wanting you to hear because the devil's convinced you it's not important. So I'm just saying to you that what God says to every single one of these churches, he's not talking to some ancient church somewhere in historical life. He's talking to you and me and our church and all the other ones around us. And he says to this one and to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. What, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who've not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes, say, victorious. victorious. If you will allow him to make you victorious. How do you get victorious? You come to the cross and die of yourself, and allow him to live in you, then you become an overcomer. See, this is a word to you who are sitting here in this building and around all of these saved people who know the Lord, and you are lost as a Christmas goose. You have done, you, you got, you, you're 12 inches from being saved. You got, you got it up here, you just don't have it right here. And you're going to miss heaven by about 12 inches. And Jesus is saying, let me take you to the cross where you can really die of yourself so you can stop playing these silly, ridiculous games that you play, pretending to be something, and you're not changed. You've never been converted. Your life is still just a series of missteps and misadventures and misdirection, and you keep trying and falling and trying and falling and trying and falling because there's no indwelling Holy Spirit inside to move you forward in a positive direction. And he's saying, open up and listen. If you will let me make you an overcomer, you shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Wait till that one. You'll, you'll be shocked by this. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is talking to a dead church. Used to, have, used to be alive. Used to have a great name. Stuff used to happen there. The Spirit of God used to move there. Everybody, if you move from, if you move from Ephesus to uh, Sardis, or if you move from Smyrna to Sardis, and, and your pastor knew you were moving, he'd say, you know what you need to do? You need to go down to First Church of Sardis because, man, that's the place where things are happening. That's the place that's alive. And then you'd take his recommendation. You'd go down to Sardis. It'd be dead in a hammer, and you'd get infected with the spirit of deadness rather than the spirit of life, and it would become a trap to you. You, you. you know, churches where the spirit of God is left, they do a lot of talking about things that used to be. If you're in a church, and I'm talking to these guys online, and you guys are listening here, if you're in a church that uh, their, their whole ministry is to talk about what we used to be, you're in a dead church. Dead churches talk about how it used to be and what things used to be like, live in the past. He says, you have a name that you were alive, but the problem with you is you're dead. Mints no bones about it. Deader than a hammer. And so who's writing this? Just, I mean, look uh, at first verse. And to the angel of the church of Sidus write, these things who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars in his hand. All right. You know because you've been here all the time, and I, don't, I'm, I'm, I know it's redundant for me to repeat myself because you remember everything I say. But, but just in case, just in case somebody watching might not have been here before, uh, seven, the seven uh, spirits of God, there are not seven Holy Spirits. That's, there's only one Holy Spirit, so he's not saying, I'm holding seven Holy Spirits. He's saying, Isaiah 11, verse 2, read it sometime. Isaiah 11, 2 says that the Spirit of, of Christ is a, 
sevenfold manifestation. There are seven descriptions given in Isaiah 11:2. He's the spirit of the Lord. He's the spirit of knowledge. He's the spirit of counsel. He's the spirit of wisdom. He's the spirit of fear of the Lord. Anyway, read them. There's seven different descriptions of how the Holy Spirit looks, just like in Galatians 5:22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, grace, and faith, and meekness, temperance. In other words, there are not seven fruit of the Holy Spirit, nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. There's only one fruit. It has nine flavors. The fruit of the Spirit is, not the fruits are. There's only one. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, blah, blah. All right. In other words, when you get full of the Spirit, this is how it manifests itself. You don't get love and then not get joy. You don't get joy and not get peace. It's not a shopping list. You go down and pick what you want. If you're saved, your whole life gets better with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. I'm just to ask you, how you doing? Since you've come to the Christ, are you any more loving than you used to be? Is your life any more joyful? Do you have any more peace? Is there any more gentleness, goodness, greatness? Do you self-control? Is it better than it was? Well, if it isn't, then that means there's no Holy Spirit dwelling there. That's a testimony to say, what's wrong with me? And let the Holy Spirit say, surrender, brother. Wave the white flag. You, you, I mean, you were convinced up here that you needed me. Now, just open up and let me come in. How about that? I mean, this is the word, seven spirits of God. That means, and the, word, and, and the number seven, and I don't want to make, get too mystical, but you're going to see seven throughout the whole book of Revelation. Seven just means complete. It means full. It means perfect. God created everything on the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Everything was done, perfect, complete. So when you see the number seven, basically he's saying, I hold in my hand the complete work and power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. And he said, I got seven, I got the seven uh, stars, which the stars are the pastors or the angel. I've always wanted to be a star. You know, we have movie stars and athletic stars and, and, and uh, drama stars and, movie and, and, and musical stars and all that kind of stuff. But the real stars of God are his angels, his ministers. And he said, I got, my, I got the complete ministry through the leadership in, my, in one hand and I got the Holy Spirit in another hand. And he said, the reason you are dead, what does that have to do with a dead church? Well, it has everything to do with a dead church because here's the truth. God said the only way that your church will come alive is if you allow the Holy Spirit of God, the complete Spirit of God, to move through the complete ministry of the leadership of your church to guide that church under the direction of the Holy Spirit and lead them in the direction Christ wants them to move. Your church can't be led by a denomination, by a hierarchy, by bishops, by elders, by deacons, by committees, by boards, by structure. If it is, you're a dead man. The only way God chooses to lead his church is the power of his Holy Spirit to empower the man of God to lead the church in the direction of God and the Spirit of God. Amen. 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 Now, I didn't, I mean, I didn't make up that plan. That's not my plan. But that's what he's saying there. He's saying, I, the one talking to you has the f fullness of the Holy Spirit and the men of God, and they got to be together or you're going to be dead. I'm asked quite often, and some of the guys watching online, and maybe even some of you guys that are sitting here, think to yourself, man, I'm in a dead church. Maybe, maybe this is not your church home. Maybe you're visiting from somewhere else or you're watching online from somewhere else. You're saying to yourself, that dead dry hole I go to every Sunday is just ridiculous. It might be why some of you are sitting, you know, there in your bathrobe watching right now. Because you don't want to go to that dead dry hole. I don't blame you. It's dead, deader than a hammer. And here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, should I stay here or should I go to another church? And I'm just giving my best counsel, all right? I'm not trying to be mean. And I'm, I'm not accusatory of any church anywhere. But I'm just saying to you that what you're thinking is, you are thinking, well, maybe I can get on fire. 
right? You're thinking that. Okay, maybe, maybe I can become a live coal off the altar of God. Maybe me and my family can get fired up about Jesus and we can help this church get fired up about Jesus. So I don't need to leave it because I might be the only chance it has to, for a coal off of the altar of God to start burning again. Now, I wish that that would be possible. But I'm going to tell you, I've been in the ministry for 43 years, and I've never seen that happen, ever. I've never seen a person from the congregation lead a church to become alive again. The only way that church will ever come alive again is if an anointed man or woman of God walks in with the authority of God and the full of the Spirit of God and is allowed to lead that church in God's direction which ain't going to happen in about 99.9999 of them because they're going to get run off before they can ever even do anything. Because some board or some elder or some constitution or some crowd rules the place, and they'll never even be given an opportunity. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying you need to get yourself and your family, and you need to ask God to lead you somewhere where there's an anointed ministry under the Holy Spirit of God before you have the same testimony Sardis has. You used to be alive, but now you're dead. And so Jesus, it's Jesus talking to this church. And what does he say? What does he say is wrong with it? He says, well, uh, let me do what's right first because it's just a verse here. You, you have a, look, 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 doesn't it sound like the Lord is really almost amazed himself? I mean, you have a few names even at Sardis. It's like the Lord said, oh my goodness, there are a few names even at Sardis. So the Lord is surprised almost that there are a few names even at Sardis, which is an indictment. I, I mean, I, look, you know what our battle here at Freedom River is? Our battle here at Freedom River is that the Lord wouldn't look at us one day and say, uh, there are a few of you who are still alive. Uh, but most of you are dead. That's an indictment from the Lord against the church because there are always a few that are alive. I, you know, in whatever dead church you're in, there's going to be a few, there are going to be a few like-minded people like you that are going, you know, maybe we could make a difference. Let's get together. Let's pray. Let's make it. And you think that's going to matter, but mm -mm, mm -mm, comes from the top down, not the bottom up. And, and, and it's God's anointing and God's authority, and he works through a pattern and an organization, and that's the way he says it is. But there are a few names, even at Sardis, that have not been rose. So our challenge is not for the Lord to look at us one day and say, you know, even at Freedom River Church, there are a few that are not dead. Our challenge is for the Lord to look at us and say, man, with a church that lively and led by the Spirit of God, I'm amazed that anybody's dead at that church. That's what we want to hear from the Lord. And so he says, there are a few names that are still hanging on that are not dead and, and have not defiled their garments. Garments are symbolic, analogous to our character and our life. The Bible, and I wrote it in your notes, gave you several references, look it up. In the Bible, when the Bible talks about garments, it's talking about your character and your life. He said, you know, Isaiah said that, that our goodness is as filthy rags before God. We look like a filthy, moth-eaten rag before God. When we're as good as we can possibly be without Jesus changing our life, we look like a nasty, eat-up, cankered-up old rag before God. That's how good we can be. The Apostle Paul said, put on the new man and put off the old man, just like you put on your clothes every day and you take off your clothes every night. Garments are always a picture of your character and your life. What is he saying? He said there are a few people there who, who, whose character has not been cankered uh, uh, and, and, and defiled. And notice how you stay pure and they shall walk with, everybody say, with me. The way you get pure is to walk in him. It is not, you cannot do it on your own. You cannot make yourself good. You are not pure and clean and, and white charactered and white spirited because you're a good person, because you act good, 
because you've been educated and trained. You are made this way by the Spirit of God. So the good things are, man, hey, even though you're a dead bunch of people, uh, you seem, you know, there are a few people there. And, and so what's wrong with them? And to the angel of the church, right, right uh, he who has the seven spirits of God, seven stars, here it is. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. There are two things wrong with this church. Number one, it's a dead church. In other words, the Spirit of God used to be there, but it's not there anymore. Do you believe that the Spirit of God can depart from a place? Well, let me just give you an example. And uh, hang with me. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, there are many examples. There are many, wor- there are many pictures. I, everything that happened in the Bible happened in the Bible just like God said it did. They're not just pictures that somebody made up and said, let me tell you a story that might sound good and illustrate something in the New Testament. Every, every piece of the Word of God is God's Word. I believe every syllable, every grammar, every alphabet, the holy grammata is what the New Testament says, which means letters of the alphabet. God not only anointed the words and spoke the words, but he even spoke the letters that make up the alphabet that make up the words. That's how minute God says his uh, inspiration of the Word is. I believe, every, I believe everything about the Bible. I even believe the cover where it says Holy Bible. Yep, it is. So I'm just saying in the Old Testament, there's a picture of the Spirit of God departing off of the temple of God. In the book of 1 Samuel, and you know, I know some of you say, first who? Yeah, there, there's, there's six or seven books of history in the Bible. 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Samuel tell you all about what happened during, during the whole king lineage of, of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, there's this weird little story. It's a story about Eli, who is a priest, who has two boys named Hophni and Phinehas. Eli is the priest and is in charge of the temple of God, and he allows his son, Hophni and Phinehas, both of them to become reprobates. They go down to the temple and they have sex on the altar. They go down to the temple and they eat the sacrifices that the people put down there that are given to God. They're totally deviled, reprobate individuals. And Eli does nothing about it. Eli's dad, Eli doesn't prohibit that, hinder that. Eli's just a happy, fat old sucker sitting on some chair. By the way, that's how he died. He was so big and fat, he sat down in a chair and the chair broke and he fell over and broke his neck. And then God killed Hophni and Phinehas, his two boys. Well, on the day Phinehas, one of his boys, died, Phinehas' pregnant wife had a child, and you know what they named him? Ichabod. What does Ichabod mean? It means no glory. It means the glory is gone. It means the Spirit of God is no longer dwelling there. And in the ancient book of Ezekiel, there's actually a picture of the glory of God leaving the Ark of the Covenant, leaving the Holy of Holies, leaving the temple of God. The last time they see it is out on the Mount of Olives just before it disappears and draws back up to heaven. And God writes over the door of national Israel, Ichabod, the Spirit of God has departed. So Jesus is just saying, look, You can become so dead that you used to be alive, but now the Spirit of God is no longer there. The Spirit of God does no no longer convicts and moves and works in the people. And you might as well write Ichabod over the door out there as people come in so they'll know there's no Spirit of God working in this place. And so Jesus said, this is the church that used to be something, but it's no longer something because God's not there anymore, and you are dead. You have a name to be alive, which just means you're a trap to people. Hungry-hearted people come in there. They remember what you used to be. People give them testimonies of what you used to be. Your neighbor said, yeah, go with me to church down to First Sardis. It's awesome. It's great. Our kids' ministry, our blah, 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 blah. Hadn't been that way in years. But you have a name, and those hungry-hearted people come in there, and then that spirit of delusion gets on them, and that spirit of complacency gets on them, and, and now they're just as dead as you are. They used to be, they used to want God, they used to follow God, they were ready to hear God, they were fired up about the things of God, and then they walked into that death trap, and it just death just enveloped them, and now they're just like you. So it's dangerous. It's a trap to spiritual people. And Jesus said, you know what's wrong with you? You're dead and you attract people to, 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 to kill them along with yourself. So what are we going to do about that according to God? 
Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. In other words, there are some things that are teetering right on the edge of death. And if you don't start paying attention to it, and they're, it's going to die. I mean, there are just a few little tiny embers that might still have a little, little, little life in them that you can blow on and you might spark something back to life. But if you, keep, if you keep being complacent and you keep being carnal and you don't pay attention, these things are going to die because they're ready to die right now at this moment. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Let me just say this about being perfect. Back in the 80s, how many of you remember a movie called Ten? Remember a movie called Ten? Hey, don't be afraid to raise your hand. I'm not trying to trick you, okay? I mean, I know you didn't see it because it was carnal and fleshy, but I know. But, but how many of you remember the name Ten? Okay, good. All right, now. Um, you know, there are still people that rate people on, that's a Ten. I mean, I know that's wicked and idiot and all that kind of stuff, but some people still do it. That's a Ten. Well, what is a Ten? A Ten is somebody that's perfect. And everybody's looking for a 10. Well, according to God, now listen, and I want you to, to know this. According to God, you're either a 10 or you're nothing. There's no fives, no sixes, no sevens, no nine and a halves. You are either a 10 or you're nothing. What makes you a 10? The Spirit of God. In other words, God, God doesn't halfway save you. God doesn't halfway clean you up. You are a 10. I mean, uh, think about it like this. One of the definitions of sin is to miss the mark. Now, what that means is God has a target out here, and, and he's going to shoot an arrow, and you're going to shoot an arrow at the target. All right, if that arrow does not hit dead bullseye, you miss the target. The target is a 10. God intends for all of us to be 10. The only way we can be 10 is that his Holy Spirit indwells us and makes us clean and perfect. You cannot be perfect because you act good, because you are good, because you think good. You are not that good. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not that good. Because here's the truth about the target. I don't care if you miss the target by one inch, by one millimeter, by one micrometer, by... 132nd of an inch, you miss the target. So it doesn't matter if your little arrow goes, you know, and hits about right there, or if it misses by a 32nd of an inch, you still missed. You can drown in an inch of water, but you're still dead. It doesn't matter if the water's 100 feet or an inch, you're still dead. And so what God is saying is the measurement is me. And so the reason that you're dead is because, it, it is because I've looked at you and I found that you're not a 10. You're trying to be a 10, but you're trying to do it on your own terms. You're trying to do it in your own way. You're not letting me do it. You're trying to do it yourself, and you're missing the mark. The arrow is not on the target. So he says, well, what are we going to do to fix this? Well, he said, be watchful, pay attention, and, and, and strengthen the things which remain. There are some, some things, and so pay attention to what's going on and, and, and pray and see and, and lift and exalt the things that are, that are there for, for I've not found your, work, uh, uh, your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. In other words, look at what used to be and think about what used to be and how you used to be on fire for God and you used to know God and you used to want God and you used to be excited about the things of God and you pray and you read the word of God and you talked to other spiritual people and you hung around them and you came to Bible study and you came to prayer meeting and you did everything you could. Think about that and start doing that again. Repent. Turn around from your ways that are leading you away from God. Look, I can't do this for you. I can't make you want God. I can't make you disciplined enough to find and search and seek. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. You better listen to God. This is serious stuff. This is what he's saying here. You better watch this. Be watchful and, 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 and remember what you received and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I'll come on you as a thief and you not know what hour I come. That, that's not talking about 
the, the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is in Thessalonians where Jesus says, no, I think it's in Matthew where the actual term may be in Thessalonians too. But the rapture is described as uh, the Lord speaking, come up here and, and the dead in Christ start rising, all of their bones and bodies and cremations and, 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 and shark eating them and blown up on a mountaintop and you know whatever they might be, God collects the molecules of their, of their existence and brings them back. And then we which are alive on the earth, we, when they get where we are, then we all go up together and we meet the Lord in the clouds. That's what Thessalonians says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And, um, and, and, and so... That's the rapture. And in Matthew, that's where it says, it said two of you will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one will be left. Two of you will be walking in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Because I come, Jesus says, as a thief in the night. Now, a lot of people, when they read that, they say, man, he's talking about the rapture when everybody gets done. No, he's not. He's talking to a church who has a name to be alive on this earth but are dead or in a hammer and don't care about it. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm coming like a thief upon you. In other words, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. What is true about a thief in the night? You don't know that they're there until they've gone and you see what's missing. So Jesus said, I'm going to come on you and I'm going to take something away from you. Something that belongs, the difference between heaven's thief and the earthly thief is heaven's thief only takes what belongs to him. An earthly thief steals what doesn't belong to him. Heaven's thief st- takes what does belong to him. What belongs to him? His Holy Spirit belongs to him. His anointing belongs to him. His power belongs to him. So he said, look, if you don't pay attention and change what's going on there, like a thief, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove my spirit and I'm going to take my spirit away and you're going to be dead in a hammer and nothing will ever happen there anymore. Nothing true, nothing spiritual. And you say, is that right? Well, let me just tell you this. Asia Minor, which is now present-day Turkey, used to be the hotbed for spiritual activity. All of these churches are in Asia Minor, The Apostle Paul's ministry was in Asia Minor. Timothy pastored in Asia Minor. The beginning of the church basically was in Asia Minor. Everybody that got saved, the Philippian jailer was in Asia Minor. All these stories out of the Bible where God shook prisons and worked miracles and did all kind of majestic, wild, crazy things, it was in Asia Minor. The Spirit of God in Turkey was running wild and the Spirit was saving people and people falling on their face and miracles and all of that. That's what happened. The Holy Spirit's hotbed was on Asia Minor, but now it is one of the most closed places to the gospel in the entire world. What happened? God came like a thief and removed the Spirit off of Asia Minor, and there's no Holy Spirit working there. Just like he said. That's how serious God is. I'm just saying, are you hearing this? I know your house is not Asia Minor, but he's talking to you. What makes a church die? Five things. I'm not going to preach on them, so relax. I know Tanya just took a deep breath. <laughs> Unsay, here, here's what makes a church die. Unsaved people replace saved people in places of leadership. You say, that would never happen. Well, you just haven't been around long enough. You know, what ha- you know how unsaved people replace saved people in leadership? By elections. Well, let's let the people vote on it. Let's let them elect some deacons. And then the most popular people get elected, not the most spiritual people. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a bunch of deacons, a bunch of elders, a bunch of people leading the church that, don't, that aren't true, that aren't right. They're popular, but they're not right. You might as well get the pallbearers. Go ahead and call them because the church is about to die when that happens. Number two, when ceremony replaces substance. Oh, that's such a nice place. The choir looks beautiful. What about the robes? Yeah, we got to do the we got to do the liturgy. You know, we got to have the responsive reading. We've got to make all sure everybody bows and kneels and bows and kneels and bows. I mean, we got this wonderful pomp and circumstance about life, and the people go to church. They don't even know what you're talking about. But when they go, they go, oh, this is so spiritual. This is so spiritual. And they walk out. They don't know one thing about God. They don't know one thing about the Spirit of God. But they got a bunch of ceremony that they go through every week. 
deader than a hammer. Get the pallbearers. That church is gone. When introspection replaces outreach, when we get more concerned about the people sitting around us than we do people that died, that are dying out there and need Jesus Christ, we start to die. When we become consuming ourselves and patting ourselves and pampering ourselves and loving ourselves, and we get concerned about what can we do to help so-and-so and be more comfortable and blah, 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 and we don't give a rat about people who are dying out there who need Jesus Christ, get the pallbearers because we're just gone. It's a matter of time. When social action takes priority over soul winning, that just means when we think that helping people out in the community and painting somebody's house and fixing their roof is what we're about, instead of loving people to Christ and soul winning and offering them Jesus and speaking and preaching faith, every one of us have people in our lives that need Jesus Christ. They need Jesus more than they need their roof fixed or more than they need the steps built. Now, I'm not for not helping people. I mean, I think church people ought to be gracious and helpful. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be kind to people and be helpful. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that when that replaces the fact that our mission is to fish for souls, our mission is not to walk past the real need that person has in order to buy them some groceries. I have been in ministry all my life. We ministered through Katrina. I'm telling you, we were right on the front lines. I could bore you with everything that we did. I mean right on the... We, bet, we fed over 14,000 people every meal for six weeks. The National Guard had to come into direct traffic. And you know how many of those people are with us? Zippo. They'll take everything you have and walk away and never even consider Christ. You're wasting your time, resources, energy, and efforts if you think that's going to win them to Christ. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't take opportunities to do good things and then witness to cry for Christ. I mean, that's okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't care about people. I'm just saying if you think that's what our mission is, get the pallbearers because that leads to a dead bunch. Look at your friends. Pray that God would give you an opportunity, an opening to talk about faith in Christ. Bring them to church. Let the Spirit of God have a chance to speak to them. If not, in a little while, we'll be dead. Because that's what God honors. That's our mission. That's what we're about, guys. And errant theology replaces Bible theology. What I think, what Dr. Bottlestop or Professor Whistlebritches or whatever it might be. Whatever he has to say to put doubt about the Word of God, there is no denomination, no group of people on earth who are dead right now whose first uh, stabbing of, of taking life to death didn't happen by some professors and teachers that started teaching that the Bible is not really the Word of God. If, this, if, if our Bible is not the Word of God, we have no authority. If, every, if there's one word in it that's wrong, it's all wrong. Yeah, yeah. If this could be wrong, then who's to say, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave it? Well, who's to say that's not wrong? The Bible is right. We preach it as right. We teach it as right, even when it's unpopular. Even when you look at it and go, Pastor, you're too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm held accountable. I mean, it's time you hear the truth. It, look, the letters to the seven churches is tell them how it is. And I'm just trying to be faithful to, to my over-shepherd, Jesus Christ, who said these things, not me, to tell you the truth, to take off the kid gloves, quit feeding you applesauce. This is what God says, and he's saying it to you before it's too late. Yeah. Pay attention to the things that are just about dead. You just got to up one more chance, man. Come on, come alive. And then he promises this to you if you will let him. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, which just means, you know, Isaiah said our goodness is his filthy rags before God. Uh, Paul told us to put off the old man and put on the new man. Uh, uh, Jude talked about our garments being spotted with the flesh. In other words, this verse now says, all right, if you'll let me make you an overcomer, you can take off those old filthy, ragged things and be clothed with perfection. 
He said, I'm going to give you some white to walk in. I'm going to, uh, you're going to, your character is going to be pure and undefiled. Let's take that old filthiness off of you, and we'll give you a brand new suit to wear. We'll give you a brand new life to put on. You say, man, I don't want to be the way I used to be. Well, you'll never learn enough. You'll never grow enough. You'll never train enough. You'll never study enough to be any different than you are. It takes the Spirit of God being birthed in you so that you can take off those filthy rags of your own goodness and put on white garment that's clean before God. And God said, if you'll let me, I'll knock those rags off of you and put on some white garments and I'll not blot your name out of the book of life. This is going to blow your mind because, whew, Pastor, you need to get in shape. You do? I'm sorry. I'm, I know I'm yelling, but I'm not really mad at you. I mean, you know this, right? I love you people. But I mean, I'm just, I don't know. But anyway, passion, fired up. All right, now this is going to blow your mind because everybody in here, your theology about this book of life is shaped by songs that people write, not by the Word of God. Write my name in the book of life, you know. So you think your name gets written in the book of life when you come to Christ. No, no. Read the Bible. I put the references in your notes for you so you can read them. The Old Testament and the New Testament both talk about this book of life in all those passages I put down. In every single one of those passages, your name is already in the book of life. You must be blotted out to not be there. Uh-oh. You mean my when I come to Christ, he doesn't write my name in the book of life? No, I don't care what that gospel quartet sang about. That's not theology. That's goofy. That's, that's what happens to us. We believe that kind of mess instead of God, and nobody ever tells us that God's word says anything different. Here's what happens, and I don't mean to lay a burden on you, and I don't make, mean to make anybody cry or be uncomfortable, but here's the fact. The fact is when you are conceived in the womb, I'm not talking about after seven days, 10 days, 14 days. I'm talking about when that egg pop, when that sperm pops that egg and, and, you, and you are conceived, you become a living soul. And you have a name. You say, what's my name? I don't know. To God, you might be honey, sugar pie, sweet cakes. I don't know what your name is to God, but it's something. You know, all of us have nicknames. The people that love us give us a nickname, right? I mean, you might be William Bartholomew Fitzgerald III, but they call you Bubba. <laughs> because to you, you're Bubba. Because they don't know William Fitzgerald Henderson III or whatever. They know Bubba. That describes you to them. That's a love name for you because they love you. They know you. They call you by a love name, not this official junk. God's got a love name for you. And, whenever, and listen to me now. And whenever you're conceived, I don't care if you're miscarried the next day or the next five minutes or you're aborted or you die as an infant or whatever, your name is written in the book of life when you become a living soul. So comfort to you parents who have miscarried. One of these days you're going to get to heaven and there's going to be a full-grown ambassador of God that's going to come running to you and say, Mom! Because they don't stay babies. Look, there are no babies in heaven. There's another thing. We let artists and goofy English historians and blah, blah tell us that cherubs are baby angels. Read the Bible. It was cherubs that God put around the throne to keep Adam and Eve, I mean, around the garden to put, keep Adam and Eve out of there. Look at them described. They're monsters, man. A cherubim is not a baby angel. A cherubim is an angel that is strong enough to keep men from eating from the tree of life. He's a warrior. He's scary. He's tough. You want to tangle with a cherubim. So you're not going to stay a baby for, I mean, think about this. A baby doesn't know anything, can't feel anything, doesn't think anything. They don't even know who they are. They have no self-awareness. They have no consciousness of anything. Can you imagine? Would, wouldn't it be terrible of God to curse someone for all eternity to be something that never felt anything, heard anything, knew anything, or knew anything they are? Come on, man. When you get to heaven, it's going to be a full-grown son or daughter of God that's been reared by Jesus himself. 
God is the father of your, uh, uh, of your uh, uh, aborted child or your miscarried child or that little infant that died. Jesus is his brother. God is his father. He's been brought up around the throne of God. And when you see him in heaven, he's going to be a full grown son or daughter of God. And you're going to have a reunion because his name or her name got written in the book of life as soon as they were conceived. And when you reject Christ, are you listening to me for the final time? Do you know that you can reject Christ enough that God will leave you and he will never bother you again? Do you know that the Bible talks about sinning away your day of grace? That's an old-fashioned term, but it's real. That you can sin, you can, you can reject Christ so much that he just walks away from you and the Holy Spirit never convicts you again. You say, wow, I don't want that to happen. I feel so bad. Well, if you're feeling that, guess what? You're not too late. You better, you better take advantage of your chance. Because one of these days, you'll walk in those church doors back there, and everything in here will be just as dead and dry. The Spirit of God, people be passing out in here. The Spirit be so strong, you'll just be sitting there twiddling your thumb, saying, when's this going to be over? Because the Spirit of God will not move in you anymore because he has departed. The Bible says the Spirit of God will not always, always strive with man. In other words, one of these days, that you could be separated from the conviction of God. So while you have a chance, come on. So when you come to that final point where you finally reject him for the last time and he's never going to work with you again, here comes the eraser and out goes your name. So you don't get written in, you get blotted out. So the concern is, I don't want to be blotted out. Because he says, "If if you'll come to me, I won't have to blot you out. And then he says, and I'll confess your name before my father and before his angels. And that's why we have a public invitation. That's why when just a moment when I pray and say, stand and close your eyes and pray this prayer. And if you've come to Christ, here I am. Come to me instead of walking out that door. I'm giving you a chance to say, to publicly confess that Jesus Christ has just changed my life. And I confess that Jesus is my Lord before you, a man. So that the Father before the angel, so that Jesus in the presence of his Father can say, look at, look at John, look at Honey Pie, look at Bubba, look, you know, look at Sweetie. Yeah, there she is. You see, she's confessing before men that she loves you, and I'm confessing before that I died for her and that she's saved. And the Father says, all right, there's the name right there. That's beautiful. Let's just close the book up. Come on, we got other work to do. Jesus said, if you'll let me, I'll keep you in. If you'll let me, I'll make you an overcomer. If you'll let me, I'll occupy your life. So Sardis, even though you used to be alive, you're now dead. Look, nobody wants that testimony. Nobody wants to be a church that that had a great name but is dead. Nobody wants to be a person that had an opportunity to be real with Christ but end up on the scrap heart yard and, and going through the tribulation and end up in hell. Nobody wants that. So Jesus is saying to us, do you have your ears on? Yeah. Are you listening to what I say to you today? Because this is the reality of the word. Jesus said, tell them like it is. Mm-hmm. And this is how it is. Now listen, a couple of churches from now, we're going to leave this is how it is to so this is how it's going to be. And believe me, you want to be ready for how it is because you ain't going to like this is what it's going to be. All right, stand your feet. 